Have you ever asked yourself why we do business and why we invest? Our society's dominant narrative is that they're intended to generate a profit and create wealth, period. But what if the real purpose of business and investing is to solve big problems and display the intrinsic beauty of creatively doing so, the fruit of which is making a profit and creating wealth? Today, we learn from Wesley Lyons, co-founder of Eagle Venture Fund, an impact venture capital fund with offices in Dallas and Zurich. Wes reveals how the fund, an affiliated venture lab, and other forms of support for founders have allowed them to carefully curate a portfolio of early stage companies, but companies that are creatively addressing problems like poverty, modern slavery, human trafficking, and more. Yet surprisingly, despite these non-financial purposes, the financial fruits of this work for investors are those we normally associate with more conventional venture capital. Stay tuned as we explore the nature of venture capital for impact and the role it can play in both a portfolio and in creating greater joy right now on the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Welcome to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. I'm your co-host, Roshan Langani. Here we've got Adrian Nicholson and Eric Olson with us today, and we've got a special guest, Wes Lyons. Uh, Wes, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're looking forward to, to the conversation today. Now, Eric, you met Wes before, correct? That's how you made the connection. Yeah. Yeah, I've met Wes on numerous occasions, and only probably in the last six months did I really start to put together that the world that he operates in of venture capital and the world that is of interest to me, which is impact investing, had an intersection. And so uh, I was invited to a lunch with him about a month back and uh, learned a lot more about him and his work and his story and thought, dang, we need to get Wes on this show. Yep. And I'm looking forward to it. And Adrian, I know you, you and I discussed it. We were looking forward to this episode as well. How's your week been so far? Yeah, everything's been good on my end. I'm really excited just to get right into today's podcast. We're really excited to have you on again, Wes. Thank you. So, Wes, Wes you're a general partner at Eagle Venture Funds. Can you tell us, uh, just tell us about the the fund itself and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate um, everything you all are doing and the chance to be here today. Uh, Eagle Venture Fund mm -hmm. um, pulls capital in the private markets and gets to allocate it into mostly technology companies that are very young. They uh, they have proved an idea usually and are ready to need some more capital to be able to bring an idea to market. Usually it's a software that helps businesses uh, do something better, faster, cheaper, or fix a problem that, that exists in the market. And we've gotten to partner with 27 entrepreneurs over the last six years and to partner with them from um, sometimes we're helping create the company from uh, from scratch. Sometimes we're helping change the business model. In all cases, we're bringing capital to the table uh, and do a lot of coaching with them as well. Um, but it's a it's a delightful um, it's a delightful line of work getting to partner with entrepreneurs are a special breed of people that can really just see a problem and say, I could fix that. And they start building teams and building systems and uh, and fixing problems for things that are um, things that could be done better in the world. We we kind of lionize the idea of the entrepreneur in the, in American um, society, um, but it's a really hard journey. They they have to start with just the idea that something could be fixed, that uh, we think of Amazon of starting with books of, oh, wow, somebody could buy a book much, much more easily. But there was so much work to get from the concept that the, you could have a digital marketplace all the way to it, to what we see today. And we get to be part of that. So... So Wes, I can imagine some of our listeners right now are saying, I'm not sure I'm going to listen to the rest of this because I just don't, I, I don't know how this applies to me. So we have, as I, as I explained to you shortly before we began recording today, that most of our clients are people who are sort of they've had, had a chance to accumulate some wealth. Uh, oftentimes that means they, they're just a little older as a, uh, that's their story that led them to that point. And they're trying to figure out, okay, if there comes a point in time where I cease to work, what am I going to do to keep putting food on the table? Or at least how do I do that in an optimal way? And so accredited investors to a large extent, though not exclusively. 
many of them are are unacquainted with when at least when they initial initially start working with us they're unacquainted with some of the ways in which people can allocate capital beyond just you know mutual funds exchange traded funds stocks bonds what have you and so the journey into discovery of various alternative forms of investment uh, whether that's real estate deals or uh, you know different sorts of private equity funds that in itself is a learning curve when we say hey net, think con- consider it a venture capital com- sleeve as part of your overall mix uh, that's a different conversation altogether so help our, our listeners understand why it is because you have a background as an advisor and i do want to explore your background a little bit in just a few mm-hmm. minutes as well but help our listeners understand why is it that venture capital is something that should be on their radar screen doesn't mean everyone should do it in fact maybe mm-hmm. most of them shouldn't mm-hmm. but what is what value does it add from the vantage point of the investor to the overall mix yeah, it's a really good question. And we this this journey for me really did birth walking with high net worth families and trying to help help them build kind of the holy grail portfolio, which I I define the holy great grail portfolio as um the the wise man from thousands of years ago, um, ta- um Solomon talked about the idea that six or seven risks were kind of the the way to expose an investment portfolio. And um, kind of the default on Wall Street, the default when you typically um, build a portfolio is to grab two risks, stock portfolio, bond portfolio. And we were we were six, seven years ago getting really worried about really low interest rates were creating exceptionally um, substantial risks for bond portfolios and starting to explore how do we allocate to other types of risks? It started with real estate uh, exposures and private private placements in real estate and gravitate, it gravitated into other forms of real assets and hedge funds and ended up landing into um, a, a systemic way of being able to expose uh, expose our clients to early stage technology companies. And what, what we found that we absolutely loved in a diversified portfolio of early stage technology or early stage um, growth investments was um was that you have a truly different risk so our portfolios tend to be 10 to 20 uh, tech companies that as an example one is a virtual reality language learning platform and the primary Mm. driver of whether this investment succeeds is whether um the the metaverse kind of takes takes hold writ large and whether they win the marketplace of being the language learning platform in the metaverse and what I love about that is it's a truly different risk from interest rates and GDP. And so if it's mm-hmm. done well and done skillfully, you can take a slice of your portfolio and actually have a different risk and and find that you can have a slice that truly is correlated with a completely different risk from uh, interest rates. And it's hard when you look across stocks, bonds, even hedge funds, easy, even real estate to find find risks that are good risks and the the good part is is really key you got to have a lot of talent in in deploying but good risks that don't correlate with interest rates or gdp that's how that's why it makes sense for um that's why you see so many um kind of pension funds and and higher net worth families trying to expose because if you if done right you can actually have a truly different risk Hmm. Well, uh, to our listener, I want to say I'm not going to have this become a two hour conversation. But Wes, just on the basis of what you said right there, I wish it were because there's just so much that you've just said that I find so interesting and what would love to explore. Uh, but so I want to hit I want to hit the pause button and not this isn't a tangent. Actually, it's just to, to say let's let's pause on that right now and talk about you. You have a really interesting background. First of all, you're not just a, a venture capitalist. You're a dad. You're a husband. Yes. Uh, you're a former naval aviator. You founded two funds. You have, you've you mentioned, one, or we've mentioned one, Eagle Venture Fund, but there's also a Wavemaker real estate fund. So tell us a little bit more about your story and what was it that you, you told that you were working with high net worth fi- families trying to find the the holy grail. How did you get from little boy to to where we are right now <laughs> uh the short version uh grew up in a missionary family um and um and would never i mean just such a meandering journey but the lord took me to the naval academy so i could row for their rowing team and got to have an get an engineering degree there and my uh, mm. i met my wife there we both were naval aviators for almost a decade getting to 
to hunt submarines, find bad guys, and and learn to lead effectively um, over in combat and um, in a lot of different situations. But the whole time through that uh, that eight years of active duty and um, and in reserves, I always had a book about God and a book about money and a and a passion to. I, I just love investing. There's something about it that has always mm. attracted me. I think. Uh, I think I was created to to invest, um, and mm-hmm. uh, and partnering with entrepreneurs has been been really transformative. Uh, and part of that journey for me was um, because my faith and my relationship with Jesus are really significant to why I do things. It was really a mm-hmm. challenge for me to understand why um, why I felt called into finance. I kind of didn't really have a narrative beyond make a lot of money to give it to the people who actually do redemptive things in the world. Um, and mm-hmm. and at first, when I got into uh, advising high net worth families, I I checked out what was then called biblically responsible uh, investing, and I was not very impressed. I I was passionate about the issue of human trafficking and slavery, and when I dove into those uh, into those, um, there's a tool called Evaluator, um, and kind of started digging into um, how some of these funds were were addressing modern day slavery. The way that they addressed it was they divested of effectively Southeast Asia, kind of they do divest of portions of the world that had poor records in um, in um, in human rights abuses, which is uh, is a viable approach, but it was very uninspiring to me, and I threw the whole thing out. <laughs> I was like, if that's how you mm-hmm. deal with the uh, human trafficking, I'm out. And um, mm-hmm. but then we as we as we pursued this uh, this ability to bring the. the kind of the the phrase that we used at the uh, RIA that I was a part of was that wealth is built in the private markets and liquidity is pr- uh, provided by the public uh, and dug into private assets and venture capital. I, I ended up walking with entrepreneurs that were changing, changing the world and they were building really, really beautiful, fast growing companies very redemptively. So they were saving lives and growing fast. They were um, combating modern day slavery and growing fast. And I started to go, wait a second, if it's possible to do, I started seeing it often enough that somebody was doing deeply redemptive activities at the very core of the business that um, I had to come revisit uh, and started discovering the public uh, companies like Eventide and others to build public companies that could try to express values and just caught a vision that if it's possible to build portfolios of companies that are doing deeply redemptive activities, that that was worth spending a career on. They d- those mm. entrepreneurs just inspired me, basically. Can you share mm-hmm. one of those um, examples or one of those stories or the person that you met and talk about maybe how you met them and some of the things that they were doing in the world that you'd like to share with our listeners and viewers today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Eric was just talking about a uh, Faith Driven Investor podcast I got to be a part of with uh, Justin Dillon, who founded a company called Freedom. And he had he had formerly been a rock star. And, um, but in the portion, uh, in his journey of being a rock star, he came into um, into contact with human trafficking. And then he made a movie to tell people about human trafficking. But he realized we need big exponentially capable so- solutions to try to try to combat this there's 50 million slaves in the world today where um, and um, and the scary thing is 25,000 people start their journey of being trafficked or kind of are trafficked per day um, but all the nonprofits in the world are are going to serve 126 of those um, so we're really not wait, wait, let me make sure that we our listeners and we heard that correctly so 25,000 people a day mm-hmm. are making un- unfortunately being captured by the human trafficking, but all the nonprofit work on the planet today will only rescue 125 with dot zero of those 25,000 people. Yeah. 126. That's, that's uh, wow. uh, the Mekong group is the, yeah, that's a daily, we're just, there's a flood of evil happening and we're catching little drop drops off the side. We need, we need different ways to approach the problem because we can, quadruple the IJM budget. And unless it's done differently, you just get to 800 out of the 25,000 or something like that. Uh, we need ways to get into the thousands. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's hard wrenching. It's hard to actually get into the stories because it's so such an emotional load to, to understand what um, what different people are going through. And about half of that is labor trafficking. Another large chunk is uh, is sex trafficking and then a decent chunk of the 50,000 number is forced uh, forced marriage as well uh, which is his own issue um, mm-hmm. but uh, but Justin saw this issue and said hey the this one of the 
embarrassing and really unpleasant facts about that is that a huge portion of the labor trafficking, ultimately it's dollars that came from the US and, and Europe. Um, and the way that that happens is not that Apple says, hey, we're get, taking it to a bo board vote. Would we like to include slavery and have a little bit more profit? It doesn't happen like that. It's the tier two, tier three, tier seven supplier where I believe that Apple doesn't know um, whether the person who mined the cobalt that's in their phone was an adult paid a fair wage. And so Justin started building a software company that could help purchasing agents look into their supply chain and go, all right, which tier two supplier needs more work? And then which tier three supplier needs more work? And we've, we've invested into several companies that are trying to crack the code of essentially it's a data problem and a transparency problem that allows us to have a pocket, uh, have a phone in our pocket where we're relatively concerned that it was uh, that there was slavery uh in the production of it but we don't know what to do today is is kind of where we're at if that makes and it's not that dissimilar to what was happening in uh in britain um uh, uh, however many years ago where people are like yeah we know there's slavery but what do i do about it if that makes sense and it's entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that can start building the systems and it's a collaboration between governments also kind of turning up the dial on companies to be able to show that they're doing something about this um and even Tide's doing some really cool work around um, the um, the supply chains for one specific vertical in um, what is it in the um, solar panels, solar panels. Yeah, uh, so it's a lot of people mm -hmm. working on the issue, but um, scalable solutions like that are really exciting. So. Yeah, so just in uh, I think we should put that um, put that episode in our show notes so that people can link to that and hear you and Jason talk more about it. One of the fascinating things I thought was how clever they're going after invoice there's invoice data uh, at businesses everywhere mm -hmm. so if you can or invoices or receipts just records of the transaction so if you have the capacity electronically to just sort of me make your way back through all of that you can see the all of the flows that led to the final product um and where where they flowed through and what a what a brilliant thing so how did you find how did you find jason and how did you and, and I guess even more, this is an advisor who, um, while I'm certainly, I recognize the value of, a, of accepting risk as part of, uh, in exchange for a return. I also recognize there are times where I think, man, it is really hard to know. There's a lot of uncertainty around this. And by the way, that's why you do 20 companies and not one, but I understand that. Yeah. But there's a lot of uncertainty around any of these. How did you and your team come to the viewpoint that, hey, this is a bet worth making? Yeah. The, um, it's there's a couple elements to that it takes a lot of um rigor and due diligence and really narrowing down to business models that we that we're really good at essentially we look at five to seven hundred companies a month and do maybe one investment per uh per month and um we've niched down to um we're re we we feel like we have an edge uh, in software as a service companies that serve other companies it's kind of it's almost embarrassingly how similar the business models for the tw 27 mm -hmm. companies that you look at are uh, but if we stay super niche we spend almost no time on a majority of those 700 that come in every month because they're not b2b software as a service high impact values driven founders if you hit all four of those then we start digging if that makes sense because mm -hmm. if we're if you're not all four of those we're not the best partner in the world for you um and mm -hmm. that allows us to um i mean in, in almost any business, you hear people preaching about niche down to what you're really good at. When you when you start saying no very very effectively, then you can play where you're where you're the best. Um, and I'm not claiming that we're the best, but we're we're better at that than other things, at least. You know. <laughs> so say those four. You went through those four criteria pretty quickly. So what are the four? A software as a service. So it's a mm -hmm. uh, it's a software that is providing a service or tech enabled service um, that mm -hmm. sells to businesses. So to we're we're, it's a very different business model when you're selling to businesses versus consumers. I, for me, I'm not an expert on consumers. They feel like a black box that are fickle and who knows where they're going. <laughs> but there are people who are very good at that. That's just not us. Uh, and then if they're doing something deeply redemptive in the world, we're um, like combating, hu combating human trafficking or bringing funding to startups or um, is their product itself truly making the world a better place? Um, and then mm -hmm. for us, uh, values-driven founders are really attracted to us, um, and it, and we're able to bring um, kind of 
when when we're able to talk about their faith and their family and their business at the same time, we're able to have much deeper connections. So like Quinn Tabor leads that virtual reality company that teaches um, English. Mm -hmm. He went up and down Sand Hill Road, mm -hmm. which is the um, kind of the famous um, Silicon Valley startup road. And he got term sheets from 12 of the um, largest startups, uh, largest venture capital companies in the world. And there would have been a lot of claim to to bring in I could name the names. And if you knew venture capital, you'd be like, these are the biggest names in the world. But instead he was like, mm -hmm. all right, I got pricing from all these 12 and came back to Eagle and said, he'd rather partner with us. And it's it's because we have this values alignment and he really sh uh, shares a vision uh, with us for what he wants to get done with the world, which is in the world, which is much more than make money. Um, and we deeply, mm -hmm part of our calling as a, as a, as a firm is to reshape the purpose of business. Cause the purpose of business to us is not make money. The purpose of business is to solve problems and express creativity. And the fruit of that is that you make money. And for most of Sand Hill Road and most of Wall Street and most of uh, the, the, the funding world, it's, it is, they might talk about ethics and they're, they basically have held on to the same core of um, the purpose of business is to make money and said, but let's do it ethically. We're trying to take the very core of it and say, no, no, no. The purpose of business is actually to solve these, the biggest problems in the world. And the fruit of that is that you may, and it sounds like we're like kind of talking about semantics, but it does deeply change the way you operate. If that makes sense. Mm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And actually, just going back to the list of, of four, Wes, I may have missed one. So I want to read it back to you. Software as a service. Uh, are they making the world a better place? Values driven founders. What was the fourth criteria? And selling to businesses. Selling to businesses. Selling to business. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So mm -hmm. when you, uh, so let's, you've got those businesses you look at that are looking for investment you said about 500 a month am i did i remember that correctly and you make about one investment so there's got to be more than one that fits this criteria right that these four items you're looking for what get what gets them from the 500 you know down to the group that fits the criteria and then to investment from you it is really the this holy grail of having a business where the very mechanism that it turns br kind of just spews impact is actually fairly rare if that makes sense there's lots of mm. v values driven founders building fast growing companies but finding um like one of the companies that we're that we're in diligence on right now their very product is training people to identify human trafficking and then their other product is helping cities find um find the gaps in how they're addressing trafficking that value proposition is very rare and then like in in the case with justin and this founder we've actually been walking with them for walking with kind of is a is a generous term we've been in contact with them and talking to them and doing a little bit of coaching here and there for three years in both cases before we go all right the we knew years ago that you had a really brilliant value proposition. Now's the moment where I can bet a million dollars that you're going to succeed, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the beauty of it is, yes, we do. I mean, I probably have 10 really great places I could put capital right now, and we're only choosing the top three. Um, and it forces us, the humans make much better decisions when they're lining things up side by side and are allowed to just choose, well, which are the three that you, that we as a, as the four general partners um, believe are really, really going to succeed. That is more exciting than, oh, we only found three that hit all the wickets. Um, so yes, there are, there are quite a few more that hit all the wickets. We just choose the ones that are most inspiring and we think can balance because our job as al asset allocators is is this interesting balance of we're we're trying to come and bring extraordinary impact but also show the world that extraordinary impact can perform really well um, if we do our job in the marketplace really well they we will start to break the break the stigma that it's impossible to perform really well and have great impact um, so we have to balance those two in a um, in a skillful way. Wes, at the lunch you and I had um, a couple, about four weeks ago, you said something I didn't under, uh, fully understand. And that was that you have actually, um, as, a, as a firm, you have several funds running simultaneously, so, some with different thematic emphases. Did, did I understand that correctly? Yes, absolutely. Can you tease that out a little bit? 
Yeah, so we have um, we have our kind of main fund that just ha- it has a mandate to basically for great profit and great impact. Does that make sense? And uh, it, uh-huh. but it can touch any sort of impact. It's touching health access in poor uh, poor countries. It's touching redemptive technology use for the American consumer. It's touching human trafficking. It's touching um, uh, poverty alleviation and jobs for the poor. And what we've found is. Um, as we walk out this this core thesis, like our the purpose of our of our company is to transform a million lives. We do we get asked a lot, what it how do you measure impact? And for us, it's actually lives transformed, which is uh, we we love it when a company um, uh, takes care of creation. Well, a lot of the impact investing world is focused on creation care or um, kind of carbon and things like that. For us, it's all about lives transformed. That doesn't mean we. We don't love the love the planet, but as we walk out that that vision of a million lives transformed, it does bend and and really walk out this um, purpose of investing is to solve problems. It makes a ton of sense to group those into themes. So, of the twenty seven companies that we've invested in, about a quarter have been working on human trafficking, and um, and it's really inspiring. And the natural conclusion of of these ideas to say, well, we can build a portfolio that's just focused on human trafficking. And then uh, we had another theme around poverty alleviation and the flourishing of cities. And so we built another wrapper um, for um, for the flourishing of Dallas Fort Worth uh, to just say, what does it look like for an investment a pool of investment capital be, to be dedicated to the flourishing of a city, which primarily looks like jobs, education, transportation, and housing for people who are struggling to get it. If that makes sense. Um, so mm-hmm. at its core, it's the same mechanisms. It allows people who are pro- like primarily focused on the profit side to go into that main wide mandate fund. But then people who are no- saying, hey, I have a really huge passion for human trafficking. I'd like to get full exposure to that. Um, I've You can't find that anywhere else in the world. Or I have a passion for my city. I do want to take a portion of capital um, and allocate it to the flourishing of the city that I love. And, uh, and that's where it's really powerful for advisors to come alongside families and help them to start thinking about their different buckets of capital. Because um, by its nature, when you narrow down from all impact mandates down to a single one, like combating human trafficking, you've got to say, well, that's probably not appropriate for some buckets of capital, if that makes sense. But if you, mm-hmm. maybe you've met most of your family's goals and you're like, well, I'd love to keep growing it and have some nice upside potential, but I also want to leave a legacy of changing the world. And this is really exciting. Maybe in a DAF or something mm-hmm. or, or not in a DAF where you just feel you, you look at it and say, this should grow well. Um, and, a, and I'm willing to take a little bit of extra risk because I'm caught passionate about that issue. It's really powerful mm-hmm. to walk with advisors who can help you think through your different buckets and where you're at on your goals. And um, Because if you're feeling that freedom as a client to go, wait a second, I can take some risk to change the world and I'm on track, that's, that's where um, the whole system is working really well for that client where we build the portfolio, the advisor helps them get really comfortable and it all starts working, if that makes sense. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. So, and I, I can certainly see why a family office might say, hey, we do have these certain uh, very specific passions. It is, we've made it sort of a family mandate to address them and you give them then a more focused avenue for accomplishing that. So uh, you mentioned, by the way, I just want to hit the pause button too, to define a term. You mentioned DAF and we've talked about donor advised funds for our listeners before, but I just wanted to- That is worth defining. Maybe are newer yes. to our show. Yeah, the donor advice fund is is a it's it's like a charitable investment or checking account where you in a certain year you, or every year, but you use rather than just writing checks out to various charitable organizations, what you're instead able to do is when you let's say have an event and it's going to be a big big tax year and you have a lot of highly appreciated stock, let's say, or you're selling a business and you've got a lot of embedded capital gains in that business, you can donate units of or the entire business or whatever the case might be, whatever suits you into this donor advice fund. And then from there, um, as that becomes liquid, now you've you've gotten both the giant tax benefit from avoiding all of those embedded capital gains, as well as now you have an opportunity with that capital that's that we're for, for which you've gotten the full um, charitable tax benefit uh, uh, from the gift, you can now not just write out checks, but you can also make investments. And those investments include things like the fund that you, you've just been mentioning. So a, a tremendously cool strategy and one that in our meetings we talk about with clients. But 
but here it's really uh, glad for you to introduce it to a wider audience. So then back to then, so you have these these themes and um, Adrian had earlier asked you about a portfolio company and you you answered that and then I think you've sort of sprinkled in another uh, set of it. Is there another story of a portfolio company that you are, you just, it just lights you up when you think about what they're doing in the world? Yeah, what I'm really excited about right now is an investment we just made last week in a company called Patient Sortal. And um, I've just been discovering over the last few years the how hard it is to come out of prison in the U.S. Um, it's it's hard for a number of different reasons, getting a job and and things like that. One I didn't know until I was going through the process with Patient Sortal is... Um, is many times the or almost every time as somebody comes out of prison they're set up for failure from a healthcare perspective where they're given they uh, they're given 30 days of medications many many huge percentage are are on medications for healthcare issues that come up during during um their sentence, but it takes them 120 days to get into the system. Um, they're kind of, it's just set up for failure. They're, they're, they're taken care of for 30, but it takes 120 to get into the system. And so um, New Jersey did a study um, that they had 799 folks come out of prison, I think it was last year or the year before, and it cost the system $140 million because they went to the ER so often, uh, on average going to the ER nine times. Uh, you just look at it and go, mm-hmm. wow, this is a broken system. Uh, and what's patient mm-hmm. sort has um, has built is essentially like a digital, digital vet, veterans administration where they're walking with those inmates in the year running up to release to get them set up into a system so that instead of going to the ER, they can go to a doctor who takes um, expanded Medicare. And um, so just a deeply redemptive product to help them have a, a continuity of healthcare mm-hmm. and, um, and a scalable um, a scalable business model that could really work financially. It's, uh, I think they have... Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say no. They have a really big backlog of states that want to solve this problem. You can imagine if you say, hey, you're spending $140 million, spend a couple million here, and we can just crush that number by huge, huge amount. There's a bunch of mm-hmm. states that want to want to sign up for their service. Uh, and in mm-hmm. just, I mean, if that's, um, I mean, so much of, uh, of our lives is about following Jesus' footsteps. And he, he specifically called out caring for people who are, who are stuck, who are in mm-hmm. prison. Uh, and he didn't have caveats of only, uh, it wasn't just the people in prison who were there unjustifiably or something. He, just, he said, care for right. the prisoner. Uh, all people right. coming out fall into that mandate in my mind. So really excited about um, Kenny Eck and the patient sort of team and their potential to just every, again, this is one of those, like the very churning of the business is somebody having continuity of healthcare. You're like that is deeply redemptive. If they're able to stay healthy and stay out of prison and be a good dad, that just kind of echoes through their community because they were healthy and they're not sitting in prison sucking taxpayer dollars and not being a dad and so many things. Uh, so feeling really excited about Kenny and his team and their deal. Wow, that, that is cool. So how many states are they in already? Can you share that? Um, not the bathroom. They are live in. They they're live in two states and have twenty two. Uh, states ready to ready to go. Um, it's actually, I mean, this is the crazy thing about how our dollars actually make an make an impact. Um, it's actually our ability to put capital in that is uh, that is the throttle to how fast they open in those twenty two states. Um, and hmm. and you can that is a it's a powerful to hang on for a moment because the difference between the effect that we have when we buy and sell in the public markets, which um, people are producing some impact through proxy voting and things like that. Um, it, that there's fun stuff there. But the difference that we have on patient sortal is at this rate, they're opening kind of one every couple of months as we, we're trying to get a million dollars into them as quickly as possible and um, and then hoping to help them raise another, now there's several million. Um, if they get that couple million dollars, they open all 22 nearly si- simultaneously and kind of instead of cut by the ones and twos. It, it really is our dollars change the future of these companies and uh, to your count of impacting a million lives i mean that's going to make a huge difference to uh to those lives of the the people involved you know the people coming out of coming out of prison so just getting back to the problem that they're that they're solving um if someone's in not in the two states they're in so they're in in the 48 other states right now they're getting 30 days worth of medication and can't get into a doctor for 120 days is that was it? That is, um, 
Yeah, that's that's how I understand. So, the what do right what do the people in yeah. the other forty eight states do right now aside from go to the ER? Are they go going to the ER just to get medication prescriptions filled? It seems ridiculous. The, there's a couple different. I mean, sometimes they can find a nonprofit that can help them. They often go to the. I think default is they're going to the ER. Um, in some cases, they'll steal a candy bar, candy bar, so they can get a night in prison and and refresh oh, their yeah. meds. Um, um, it's. Um, I mean, they're scrambling, trying to figure out how to how to solve the problem. Okay. And um, yeah, well, yeah. and looking at your list, I, I I'm just going back to your four criteria. I can see that had the software as a service side. I can see the selling to the business or government, you know, side in, the, in this in this case, mm-hmm. making the world a better place. Can you tell us about the founders? You had said values driven founders. Yeah, almost every time we've never promised that we will always um, invest in values-driven founders. Um, and for us, value our values are what well, um, are following Jesus. Um, and um, but it, we we have every time uh, to date, and that's a that's a key part of as a, as a, as we walk with these founders. Um, and Kenny fits that description that they're motivated by by their faith. Uh, that just is. Um, it helps us connect with founders as part of who we are. Uh, we tried to tell our story for a while without like kind of le- allowing people to know that part of our journey, but it just kind of, it, something's missing when we tell the story. It's part of mm-hmm. who we are. Um, it's, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's part, just is the story. So. Well, I love this so much. Um, I, listeners, this, our longtime listeners know that I spent some time when I was in Illinois, uh, you know, carving out weekends or longer, you know, longer weekends to go into prisons in Illinois and spend time with prisoners. And one of the things that um, the ministry that I was affiliated with would uh, try and do was help people as they were as they were exiting find a, a in some cases a six to nine month transition so that they have you know immediately it wouldn't go from just unbelievably rigid structure to zero structure the very next day. Yeah. You know, all their meals provided on one day and medical care provided on one day and then nothing provided the very next day. They're released at the gate and hopefully someone picks them up. Yeah. You know, so it, it, uh, the, the state of Illinois, at least, is um, th- there are, there's, I would say, if the state of Illinois is emblematic, let me use it that way, there's an increasing recognition among prison officials that that there's there's got to be a partnership with the private sector in order to find remedies for a lot of these sorts of things and i'm just delighted that you found it so how are you that you found a company that has at least an answer to this one that doesn't solve all the other problems that are related to coming out and not having a job necessarily and that sort of thing but if we can yeah. if, if we can start with one and then build from there well that's fantastic. where building portfolios and communities working on the same problem is really powerful because um the it, it is often if you look at who's actually in the prisons it's often religiously um driven groups often often christian groups but mm-hmm. other religions mm-hmm. as well that are actually mm-hmm. going in um and you look at the competition uh and it's really nonprofits that are trying to do non-scalable things and um, and then health institutions that aren't that interested. And w- it was interesting to do the competition analysis on that company and go, wait a second, hmm. you're looking at a bunch of non-scalable nonprofits who care, but they don't have a business model to go to a million people. They have a business model to get mm-hmm. to a few hundred and kind of, and it's this linear give them, if we can get more gifts, then we could go from 300 to 600, um, not a, Hey, we could scale. Um, but it really, my, the point I actually want to make is it takes, um, as we go, okay, that's one element of the returning citizen journey. Uh, we're in uh, very early stage diligence with a with a group focused on training uh, folks using virtual reality inside be uh, inside of um, while they're uh, while they're still incarcerated, so they can get to a place where they could be like an electrician's assistant when they come out. And it's building a portfolio. We've we've looked at other companies that are trying to create continuity of care, um, just kind of writ large uh, around the returning citizen. If you if we can build a portfolio of for profit companies that can integrate well with all the churches and nonprofits, it actually t- it takes an ecosystem of for profit, nonprofit, and government actually working together to say to solve that. Okay, I just stepped out of the um, um, I just stepped out of the prison at, or today. The stories are, well, I know you were on a wheelchair, but you don't know the wheel own the wheelchair. I hope somebody's picking you up with a wheelchair, you know, things like that. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, two, okay, there's actually a reasonable road to walk that 
a much higher percentage of people can succeed in. So. Mm. Are there any uh, common challenges sometimes you're, you're face? I know all these tech companies, that they're different in some ways, but are there any obstacles or challenges that you see where maybe it's just some, it's probably capital, some is scaling, some is having a, a business model, or maybe just connecting more with founders so they are able to, with their vision, have that redemptive that impact in the world? What are, do you see some common challenges or challenges that you you would want to share with our listeners and viewers today that uh, create maybe a lot of lessons or something along those lines? We have created an entire university called Eagle University of all the challenges that we've run into as because we've uh, the four of us have uh, as general partners have uh, founded several dozen companies and been at the founding table uh, in either a capital um, or founding relationship over a hundred times and so we've created yes there's tons of challenges to starting a company everything from did will you run out of capital forming the right team how to manage a, a board of directors and um, what we've found is it is it's superhuman to expect a, uh, a founder to be great at sales get great at marketing great at raising capital great at ma- managing people great at everything if that makes sense and so we've tra- we've actually created recently a, a management team analysis tool to just help them and it's not actually it's post decision uh, to invest to help them uh, or it's it's still involved in this decision to invest we've never s- turn from a yes to a no over it, but to help them see, okay, you have a gap in nobody on your team has ever run a board before, or nobody on your team has actually managed a market marketing team before, help them see where they might need to get fractional support. And, uh, and then we created uh, what we call Eagle University, just sharing lesson after lesson of, okay, this is how you put together a management team. This is how you hire and fire. This is how you, um, uh, this is how um, you manage a board of advisors and how that's different from a board of directors. This is how you raise capital, the types of capital that are appropriate in different situations. Um, so uh, the answer is yes, there's tons of different obstacles. And we've been, a lot of what we try to do both in our labs and in our Eagle University and and as we sit on boards is to try to help identify because there's, there's probably like 10 core competencies there that every single startup needs and it's going to be different for everyone. Are they struggling with product market fit? Are they struggling struggling with raising capital and helping? It's not always us that needs to fix, fix the problem for them every time, but if we can help them identify it and find a fractional support or something like that, um, that's a lot of that's a lot of our calling actually is to help them walk through all those challenges. Um, but usually it has to do with people problems, product market fit, market fit problems, and capital getting enough capital to to make it to the day where everything's working would be the three big bins. Um, hopefully that's a kind of a non-answer, but it's uh, hopefully it touches it. <laughs> so oh, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that was great. Wes. You touched on something that I think is important too. So a lot of times you'll hear about venture capital funding, and you hear all right, they give money to 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 firms. But you you talked about Eagle Venture University. Can you talk about what support you offer? Greater uh, in addition to, I should say, the the capital you provide. Yeah, Eagle University is a big part of that for uh, for many of our founders. We also found a quarter of the portfolio internally. In um, we have three incubators now, where we're creating companies idea up into those um, those earlier stages. And the reason for that is. Um, Everybody has heard about the Googles and the uh, and the Facebooks of the world, and they have the general idea that if you got in early, uh, you could do really, really well. And the key is actually okay, there's a couple of keys: getting the business model right, which we've dove into, um, backing, the, kind of getting access to the most uh, the most interesting deals, and then the third element that we haven't talked about is actually just getting in really early, because uh, the if you can get in when the company is worth one million, it's really different from when it's worth ten million. Like obviously. Um, um, so usually most, even early stage venture c- firms are tending to get in at 10 to 20 million and trying to ride it up to 200. Uh, and what the labs allow us to do is to be earning, uh, our inv- getting our investors in at those really early stages uh, where there's, um, that's that's kind of one of the three pillars of doing very well in venture capital is get in early. Um, and then the values driven is actually what allows us to attract the the super high end talent. Um, it's uh, get in early, super high end talent, and business models are kind of the three stools of how you how you excel in this space. 
You said something really fascinating. Again, I'm going to point people to this other episode where you and Justin Dillon were talking, which was, or one or the other of you, but I think it was you who had said that the the impact, the in, the invitation to invest in a company that has an impact was at least from not. We're not talking about the investor side. I'm talking about investing their time and their effort and their 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 skills is drawing the top 10%, <laughs> the, the top 10% of the best schools, They, when they are asked what they'd like to do, this sort of the impact theme is a very powerful draw for them. Absolutely, and I, I need to pull some be, some full stats, but if you um, if you just go interview the top, uh, top graduates from MIT, Harvard, Stanford, uh, Georgetown, all the best schools, they're all trying to find um, they're all trying to find something meaningful to do with their lives. And um, and you look at the stats and people want to purchase in line with their values. They want to go, go to churches in line with their values. They want their lives to mean something. It's just, it's a generational heart cry from Gen Z and millennials that, Mm -hmm. uh, that their lives would mean something. And, uh, and they're pretty disenfranchised by just like, Oh, buying into the system and trading, trading their lives for money is not inspiring to Gen Z. Um, so the ability to say, yes, you can do really well and be an amazing chief marketing officer if you come in and, and march this path. And on the way, we're going to solve human trafficking. They will come in like consistently. They'll come in for lower prices. You'll be able to land them over Google. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's just kind of the the number one destination for a high-end graduate, um, at least mm. in the circles that I run in. So. Well, that is that is also really cool. I have more questions, but I also, uh, uh, Roshan and Adrian, if you've got something you've been dying to ask, let me get out of your way. Eric, please, please continue. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So from the vantage point of our listeners, I, I want to, we're 45 minutes into this conversation. From So from the vantage point of our listeners that are saying, wait a second, I've never heard about anything like this before in my life, and now I want to do something. I want to. I want to participate in this somehow. Um, what should What should a listener understand about sort of what the what the the checks and the balances are that sort of um, in sort of ascertain whether that's this is a good fit for someone? And then how would they then um, if they said, okay, I I've meet all the checks and all the balances there. I think it's still sensible for me to proceed with this. How do they then take the next step and uh, invest? or at least understand more, learn more about, and possibly invest with you. The, I mean, this is, this is going to sound like a, like a mirror by, back um, to you. I passionately believe most people need an advisor who can walk them through what buckets need to uh, apply um, because you've got to take a holistic look at your, uh, at your portfolio and say, that, so we haven't talked much about the liquidity tie up in a venture capital fund. Um, we, our funds are for, um, you put in capital and then it comes out over from your kind of three to eight. Our goal uh, for our funds is to to multiply times three times to five times the capital that goes in, but you can't really predict when it's coming back and you kind of got to assume it's at least five years until your capital comes back, maybe seven or eight. Um, so you're tying up capital in a way that um, has a liquidity constraint. So you got to look at it and say, all right, this capital, I need to not have access to it for five, six, seven years is that a, it needs to be capital that you say, oh yeah, that's totally fine. I'm, I don't need to touch this for 10 years or something like that. Um, and um, and for most people, I think it's walking with an advisor who can look at private assets alongside public and say, this is where you need liquidity. This is where the tax makes sense. This is where you can take some risk for for some extra impact. Um, and uh, in general, I believe, I mean, I believe over the years, my my hope is that I'll sit on stages and podcasts and have people going, "Well, are you out? Outperf- uh, oh, we are doing well, and it's uh, kind of already coming up. But are you are you outperforming because of your impact or in spite of your impact?" And um, and I believe more and more as people see that things like that virtuous cycle of talent flowing into the companies that really change the world, they'll start. Uh, um, it's almost you can't win for lose. And now it's like, oh, you're too dangerous because you're doing impact. And then it'll turn into, well, are you using modern day slavery to outperform? Okay. What do you want? You know, like, you know. Uh, <laughs> so some people look at what we do. I mean, a lot of people look at it and just say, um, I, I'm in it for the for the finances and great that you're making an impact, if that makes sense. Um, but mm-hmm. it's a, um, 
it, for most people, it's an advisor that can help them figure out, figure that out. Um, and then if you're trying to do it yourself, you need to look at, okay, this is a bucket of capital that, uh, I love the outperformance and the impact, but, um, or I think I'm not supposed to use that. I love the performance and the impact, uh, from mm-hmm. a compliance perspective. Um, but I, uh, I can take a, take a 10 year hiatus from having access to the capital. So. Mm-hmm. Well, let me just hasten to add then, and uh, you know, our compliance department will love it, and we we earnestly mean it. Is this isn't for everybody? Yeah. Um. The, I mean, venture capital investing this isn't necessarily for everybody, but uh, uh, you know, would that would that everyone had a passion for having their investments have an impact and not just a financial bottom return? I think I can say, you know, we can enthusiastically endorse that that aspiration. So, um, and, and so listeners, yeah, please don't interpret anything that we've said here as, as a recommendation coming from us, that this is something that you ought to do. That is indeed a conversation with your advisor and Wes, I appreciate your, your referencing advisors. I know that this is a, this is an area for a lot of advisors where it's just, I just don't want to go there. It's just a little bit outside my comfort zone. So speaking for, we don't, I'm not saying that we're oversaturated with uh, advisors in our audience, but I know there are a few. So to the advisors who are thinking, dang, it sounds fantastic, but I'm just so torn. How would you counsel them to to explore uh, moving on this journey? And then I'm going to say, so actually, before you answer that, I am going to do a little, I'm going to do just a little bit of a clarification about our firm for our listeners. So there are a variety of firms that do many, many um, um you know, different things in the financial services space. Our firm, as it happens, you're listening to three advisors here from RTA Wealth Management, has among um, its its strongest um, characteristics or strongest traits or its strongest commitments is to democratize alternative investing in or what we would call modified endowment investing for the, for accredited investors, where it has formerly been, for the most part, limited in access to really only the ultra high net worth. So for us, this is an interest, and then certainly in consonant with our overall emphasis within this firm to be mindful of these sorts of things. But leaving aside, Wes, the question of our firm or another firm, let's say a listener, an advisor is thinking, yeah, I'd love to do this, something like this. And maybe their firm doesn't have an avenue for them to um, help shepherd client capital into these sorts of opportunities. How would you, how, what would you say to that advisor? I, it, um, one thing that we found is we, cause over half of our investors come through, come through advisors being former advisors, we were kind of built for independent, uh, RAs. And w- as we've looked back, we've realized in every single case when we've had, um, when those relationships, uh, have blossomed over the years, it's actually always started with the advisor investing themselves. Um, because, and part of that is just to see what it feels like. It's hard to come in. If you haven't experienced it yourself, it's very hard to sit down with a family and say, this is what it, this is what I did with my family's money. And this is what it felt like to be, la, uh, to be in a fund like that. This, this, this is what the updates feel like quarterly. Um, I would say if you haven't gone into private yourself, try, try it yourself. And then those convert, I've been through the process of walking many families into private, uh, private investments. Uh, you really have to start with yourself and experience it yourself. And then you can, those conversations go so much better mm-hmm. to say, this is, I've been doing this with the, with my family's money. And, uh, and this is what it's felt like. This is why I did it. And why I think it makes sense for you. Uh, it just makes a lot more sense than, Hey, I came up with a cool idea for your money that I haven't tried myself. So, mm-hmm. so. well, it's hard to be a founder. I'm told. Uh, so I haven't been a founder, <laughs> but it's hard to do that. That's a difficult journey. It's a, it's a taxing journey. It taxes relationships. It taxes families. It taxes mental health. In fact, I think I've heard that, uh, that among, um, founders, the, the incidence of mental health challenges is, considerably higher than in the general population. And I can certainly understand why that might be. I'm, I'm not think, thinking that as a byproduct of, or they're, they're, being a founder isn't a byproduct that they're dealing with mental health, <laughs> but instead the, the yeah. <laughs> founder produces them. So, and you have, in a sense, you've talked about wanting to follow Jesus and, in this, and, and this is a ministry as much as it is an investment company. So what is it that, that you, in addition to an incubator for these founders and helping them refine an idea and walking with them for, for a period of time, perhaps before you actually place capital, 
Uh, talk about the journey with the founder and how it is that you, you, you the founder care process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are, we've engaged uh, Joe Reed as our chief leadership development officer, and we really care about um, our founders and, and understand as founders ourselves, the emotional journey. It, uh, it's just a roller coaster to, to build a company and it takes a lot, takes a lot out of you. Uh, and he really provides resources where we have a, have a team of people that can be, uh, that are available as, um, as just um, listening ears, spiritual guides to help for us. It's primarily about tapping into a healthier relationship with Jesus because that's where everything flows for us. And that's part of why it makes sense for us to mm -hmm. partner with uh, with entrepreneurs that are looking to the, that same source. Um, but Joe Reed does an incredible job of walking. And then each general partner, every, every um, startup has a general partner that is kind of walking with them in relationship as well um and that's part of what we we get to do it's uh, I, I talk about how there's a unique relationship you can picture being a founder there's just almost nobody in your life who like everybody at church understands your faith and so they can connect with you on that your family can connect with you on your family things and then your business world can connect with you on business things there's almost nobody in your world that connect uh on both understand your business and has made a big bet that you're right if that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> understands your family because we we have families and understand your faith and so the connection we get to have with those founders is extraordinary because all three mm -hmm. biggest pieces of their lives we we can identify with um so it's really mm -hmm. i mean that's the primary joy of our work is actually walking with them mm -hmm. through the highs through the and then when you're there in the lows when they're like i'm about to run out of capital or i lost my big client or this is scary or i had to fire my um my per my top salesperson because of this then you just get to fly with them when they go i just landed facebook like this is going through the roof and I have no idea how big this is going to be. And you get to enjoy that moment with them because you've been in that dark moment where you're like, I don't know if we're going to mm -hmm. make it, you know? <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow. Well, it is, it's it really so fun. I know many of our listeners are faith-driven. Uh, many, many, perhaps many more are not. And so I, I imagine I'm just putting myself in the shoes of, of our listeners who, you know, come from different vantage points, hearing about the, the motivation that you've expressed and that the other founders that you're that you're investing in so far at least also share and there's maybe there's a little bit of head scratching there saying what what <laughs> i just don't really entirely get that so but i i want to say for the to you as a listener if you are in that situation where this does seem a little foreign to you i want to just give you a, a, you know kudos for for listening through to this point because i think what um i imagine if you're still listening you share a a, a deep uh, motivation w inside you and a stirring with it within you when you hear about these sorts of the potential for impact through investing as as something you'd like to be part of and and if you would i just want to you know i'm this we this isn't a commercial but um there is a there is an increasingly large community of people that are saying how do we invest in such a way that is redemptive how do we invest uh, how do we invest in a way that has transformational impact in many many parts of society in some cases those are models like yours west which are very high high return, long commitment, but also at an individual deal level, you know, high, let's say volatility of, of returns maybe uh, at an individual deal level, which you smooth out with, with 20 or how many of your uh, uh, projects that you have. But there are other sorts of things that, that people are doing in a redemptive way that are much more concessionary returns. And in some cases where you sort of go in knowing the, the chances of my getting this capital back in full are, are somewhat meager. And uh, just for, for you, our listener, to understand, we're at a moment of change, I think, or tension at least within the larger investment un universe around all of this insofar as regulators are, are at this point going back and forth about, well, do we, do we have an obligation to clients to insist that the advisors with whom they work um, are strictly directing them into investments that have no, what they'll say, non-pecuniary, meaning uh, there's no consideration that's taken into account other than merely the financial returns, or or can we allow you know the people the freedom as as adults to make decisions for themselves as to whether or not they're willing to sacrifice some degree of return for 
for in exchange for some other goal, like whether it's environmental care or it's you know the, in the entire ESG movement, envir- environment, social governance uh, considerations. How do we handle that? So your your role as a citizen, as a listener, is in part to make it known uh, to through your representatives and so forth as to how you view this, how this question should be resolved. Because impact the uh, impact investing will have, I think, a, a greater opportunity to grow and thrive if we're all sort of as as a society coming together about what what we think at in the ultimate sense is what we want this investing project to look like but i having said that wes i just want to you know commend you and your your team for um you're not really you know you've you've chosen to focus on those sorts of um scalable businesses that can i won't, won't say that they always will but certainly can have an outsize uh pace of growth and hence potentially an outsize uh, return for clients. Thank you. It's a lot of fun and thankful for the part that we get to play in the marketplace. There, there. You're mm-hmm. absolutely right. It's a we're part of a much bigger community. Yeah. Well, well, we're we're at the hour mark. So I just want to say, Wes, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It really has been fun to learn from you and to hear your story and your stories about some of these companies. We're going to put your contact information in the show notes, but what's the best way for people to follow you? Uh, you know, whether it's your Twitter handle or where it is that you tend to be active so that people can, can uh, stay in touch with what you're doing. We're most active on LinkedIn, um, which is where we post investments we're making. And then if you go to our website, you can sign up for the newsletter where we post uh, the active, what what we're doing. Um, so that's the best place, those two. All right. So I'm going to, people should, will see it if they look at the show notes, but if they don't, they'll be looking for Eagle Venture Fund or will they be looking for Wesley Lyons? Uh, EagleVentureFund.com is the website. And then if you put Eagle Venture Fund um, into um, LinkedIn, you'll see us as well. Okay. Fantastic. Well, that's great. Any final comments that you have, Wesley, for our audience? Uh, Thank you so much for uh, welcoming me, me into this conversation this morning. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's been a delight. All right, well, listeners, if you have you you're with us this far, I'm I'm betting that this is one of those episodes that you're going hot dog. I'm so glad I found this podcast. If I wasn't a regular subscriber before, so uh, if if you haven't subscribed, please do, and um and tell tell your friends about this episode and tell your friends about this show. I think it's your your action at this point will be be the thing that really at this stage grows people's capacity to hear the message that that Wes has brought uh, this morning, and we're excited about it all. We'll be back again next week with another episode. Next week, we're interviewing a, a friend, another friend in this category, David Sims, who is with Talent and Fund, act, active in a variety of portfolio companies in Africa. And so we'll, we'll hear more about that story next week. But for now, thank you so much for listening. This has been another episode of the Retirement Lifestyle Show.